I welcome you to the first of the new 3D Organon live webinars on transforming education through XR. I'm Theo Zuriyan, the sales manager at 3D Organon for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, and I shall be the moderator for our webinar today. Virtual reality is rapidly changing standard anatomy teaching and learning, allowing both the educator and student to visualize anatomy in an entirely new perspective. And the benefits from the advantages of immersive learning and teaching technologies is endless and absolutely immense. To share, to tell us more, share, it, share their insight and experience. And without any further ado, I would like to extend a warm welcome and introduce our two distinguished special guest speakers for our webinar today. Mr. Rob Thoreau, the Immersive Technology Manager for the Center for at the Center for Teaching and Learning at Georgian College, and also a member of the 3D Organized Scientific Advisory Board, and Dr. Sean Madoran, Program Coordinator at the Applied Life Sciences, Biotechnology and Health Program, again at Georgian College. I, let's, let, let, let's, let's listen to what Rob and Sean have to, have to say. Thank you. Rob, please. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm still not used to saying uh, uh, hello without saying something like good morning or good evening, but when you're talking to an audience from around the globe uh, and people are in different time zones, it's uh, very different for every, every listener. So we have a small number of participants, but um, uh, that's good. And it looks like the number of participants are um, sort of increasing as we go. And I'm Presume you can see my slides right now. Um, so um, I, I thought the way we would do this presentation is I would talk about some of the uh, XR initiatives at Georgian College and my colleague, Dr. Madoran would talk a bit more specifically about virtual reality um, anatomy. So um, I do come from a medical background, background. I was a paramedic for 35 years and taught paramedics for 20 years and introduced virtual reality into our paramedic program. And that led to uh, some discussions with the senior management team uh, with whom I tried to convey um, the, the, the value of uh, XR, particularly virtual reality, um, and, and make the case that unlike any other educational technology, it's one where students can actually learn in, in the three domains, in the cognitive, psychomotor, and affective domains, which is really incredible. And uh, there's a, um, a, a writer, a journalist by the name of Mike Wadera from TechCrunch who, who uh, wrote in an article once that we are transitioning from the information age to the experiential age. And virtual reality provides actual experiences. And, and one of the particular values of these experiences is the spatial experience, but also um, having agency, being able to do things with your hands, which is so important. And just to give you a, a starting example, our architectural technology program has been using virtual reality for about five years now. And the students um, design buildings in 2D, and then they go into a 3D environment. And that spatial experience of actually seeing what the building looks like with respect to their height and, uh, and so on uh, is completely different. So in that 3D environment in that virtual environment, they might look at the ceiling and think, oh, the ceiling needs to be raised two feet and this hallway is far too wide. We can narrow it by another foot. And the spiral staircase um, just doesn't belong here. So how can we, where can we move it to that won't affect the structural integrity of the building? So working in 3D is so important. And um, I attended a presentation a couple of years ago, which really inspired me. It was delivered by an architectural firm who was uh, designing, who were designing um, a children's hospital. And what they did was they, they um, converted their avatars into the size of a five-year-old and went through the hospital from the perspective of a five-year-old. And that completely changed their, their design of the hospital. So really uh, quite powerful. We're doing virtual reality in the trades. And, um, you know, in the words of Jeremy Balenson, who is the founding director of the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University, when you think about a virtual reality as a learning platform, we try to think about um, 
what can virtual reality provide that would otherwise be impossible, dangerous, counterproductive, or expensive? Uh, I would add some other qualifiers to that, like difficult and impractical and so on. But here's an example where trade students are learning to work at heights. So they learn how to don a safety harness and they learn where to hook it up so that if, you know, heaven forbid they should fall, they're falling a short, um, a short distance. Uh, we're also doing virtual reality in our maritime navigation program, our um, power engineering program, and some other trade areas as well. One of our first pilots was using virtual reality for indigenous studies for language learning. And I reached out to the faculty in that program because um, it seemed to me, I'm not a language teacher, but it seemed to me that if you're teaching a language in the home or language in the community or language in the workplace, the context would be really important. And so um, every Thursday, students and faculty meet and, uh, for example, uh, they'll meet in the home, they'll have conversations in the kitchen, um, they have an elderly who comes to visit them on a, on a weekly basis. And um, uh, the interesting part about that was that she had never used a computer before. She was 82 years old at the time, she's now 84. And they asked her if she'd be willing to go into, um, uh, into virtual reality to meet with the students and she embraced it. Um, and um, she used to meet with them face to face once a month. Now she meets with them week to week and she does prayer and she does storytelling and uh, the students love it. In fact, um, the faculty were so inspired by her, um, by her dedication to this medium that they uh, built a world in a community and named the school after her, which I thought was quite inspiring. And this is just an example of um, inside of the, the home. And it's just buffering now, hopefully it'll play for you. But um, one of the things that's incredible about meeting a virtual reality is what they describe as a sense of presence that you feel like you're actually with people, the, the kind of experience that you don't get on a Zoom call or a Teams call. So you're making eye contact, you're having a conversation and, and that's really quite powerful. And important for students to be able to meet in environments like this between classes. But um, the other important piece is that it's contextual. I'm just going to move on to the next slide here because there's not a whole lot to see other than the, the characters in here. Um, our events management students learn to uh, create and organize events in virtual reality using three different platforms Altspace VR. Um, uh, Verbello, which is a 2D platform, and Engage VR. And our veterinary technician students were doing, uh, or are doing, currently doing, um, animal dissection and animal anatomy in virtual reality. And again, here's a, a video where um, you can see the students get a tutorial from a virtual instructor, and then they get to use surgical tools to do the uh, dissection, and they're instructed through that process. And agency is so important in virtual reality to be able to do things with your hands uh, and be instructed on how to do that. So I won't play this entire video, but you get the concept. And when we talk about anatomy, this is the other important piece as well as not just seeing things from a spatial perspective, but being able to do things with your hands. Let's see here. Um, now from a skills perspective, um, this, this I think is very relevant to virtual reality anatomy. Um, this was um, the, the image on the left is a picture of a nurse, nursing student who is uh, preparing to administer insulin and she goes to the stock garbage and she grabs uh, the appropriate drug and the right dose and the right concentration and makes sure uh, that the drug hasn't expired and she grabs uh, gloves and sharps containers and all of the other things she needs and goes into the room and then goes through the process. And the ability to do that repeatedly on, on her own is really quite powerful because students may not get the same opportunity to do that in the lab. The image on the right, I, I thought was quite interesting. This was a randomized control trial. It was a small study, but it was um, uh, a group of second year medical students who were randomized to either standard uh, training for, for surgery, sort of pre-training, which is text, video, lectures. And the other group was randomized to virtual reality. And, they found that the percentage of steps done correctly uh, in VR versus standard was 63% versus 25%. And the knowledge retention of the surgical instruments in the VR group was 50% versus 11%. So, you know, I can't say enough about 
uh, embodied cognition where you're in a spatial environment, it's contextual, and you're doing things with your hands. That's really uh, important and really uh, exciting. Uh, our tourism students are doing uh, uh, tours in virtual reality. Our advanced care paramedic students are doing resuscitation in virtual reality. This one's kind of an interesting program. Um, there's no agency in the sense that the student can't do anything with their hands, but uh, they find themselves in a room surrounded by avatars, all of whom have name tags, and there's a patient in cardiac arrest on the ground. And the program uses voice recognition and artificial intelligence. So the student just talks to the team and, and uh, directs the team, takes a leadership role and, and talks to the team. So the student would say, for example, Aaron, can you check for a pulse? Phil, can you start chest compressions? Uh, Fatima, can you defibrillate and then start an intravenous line? Ross, can you give a milligram of epinephrine? And the analytics at the end of the program gives the student feedback on everything that was done, the sequence in which they did it, did they give the right drug at the right dose at the right time to the right patient, ensuring there were no contraindications uh, and so on. And so that kind of feedback is very valuable, uh, either as a formative assessment tool or a summative assessment tool for the student and for the teacher. Our nursing students are doing um, patient simulation um, at one of our campuses. And um, this is another program, which I think is quite powerful in the sense that, that um, the, uh, the students feel like they're in a hospital room with a sick patient and they're actually talking to the patient and talking to the husband or the sister or someone. And they are doing assessments so they can take a stethoscope and listen to the chest. They can apply blood pressure cuff to the arm, apply pulse oximeter to the other hand. They can pick up the phone, call a physician, give a report, get orders, and then carry out procedures. And the faculty member who's moderating this from a laptop computer um, gets, uh, again, analytics, a report on everything that was done and the sequence in which it was done. And that's really valuable for doing a debriefing and evaluating the students. The students love it because it's contextual uh, and they're able to do things with their hands. The teachers love it because it provides a feedback and that's so important. Um, we're using virtual reality anatomy and that's sort of the purpose of you know, uh, my being here and Dr. Shah Madoran being here. And uh, we're currently doing some research around virtual reality, uh, virtual reality anatomy. Um, in our biotech degree, uh, our, our nursing degree, and our paramedic program, and we're expanding the study out to our um, occupational uh, therapy and, and physiotherapy assistance course, and the acupuncture program, our massage therapy, and our uh, fitness and health promotion. And uh, so we're quite excited about that, and the students love it, and Sean can tell you more about that experience. Um, interestingly enough, I was approached by our mental health and well-being um, faculty or staff uh, last week, and they are purchasing a bunch of headsets and they're going to be looking at using virtual reality for uh, meditation and mindfulness. And so, um, a second here. Uh, lastly, uh, I just want to sort of give an overview of some of the successes and challenges before I, I, I pass off the rest of the presentation to Sean Madoran. Um, and uh, the, the the three areas in which we've had a success, one, our architectural technology program um, has been using fully integrating uh, virtual reality into the curriculum for the last five years. So it's been a huge success. Our indigenous studies language uh, program, um, we piloted VR for the first semester and they went to full integration because it's, the learning is contextual and that's so valuable. The third one, which I think is really big, is virtual reality anatomy. And I think it's so important because you, you, you're in a spatial environment, you feel like you're in a life sciences lab, the anatomical model is the same size as you, you can walk around it and do things. And I, I don't wanna take anything from, from Dr. Medoran's presentation, but um, what I could see in the future is students when they come to college, and we have 5,000 students who study anatomy in the first year, um, uh, I could see students being given the option of um, uh, signing up for a face-to-face -face class or signing up for an online class. And the online class would have a virtual reality component where student and teacher would meet in the VR environment and have a life sciences lab. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to my uh, colleague, Dr. Sean Madoran. And uh, uh, 
Let's see if I can exit this, um, my presentation here. There we go. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Rob. I'm, uh, I'm always amazed at, uh, at what we do at Georgian College. Uh, I, I find I don't know half of what's going on, but uh, I'm just amazed at, uh, at what has been produced at our college. And I uh, really want to give kudos to Rob for the leadership he's shown in, uh, in moving VR forward and moving, uh, you know, I, I think to some extent, even online learning, uh, teaching uh, forward at Georgian. When I uh, met Rob in 2005, at that point, he was already doing a lot of asynchronous teaching and synchronous teaching uh, online with his paramedic students and just finding different ways to connect with students uh, outside of a traditional classroom and giving students options of, of how they can interact with content, how they can meet with each other. Seems like it's the way uh, education is moving, that there's going to be a lot more choice about the, uh, the direction uh, that students can approach content and approach their learning. And so Rob, uh, Rob was really valuable for me just in getting me interested in VR and sort of showing me what's available with it. And I'm going to bring up uh, just a brief presentation I've set up as well. And um, as Rob said, uh, and, and Theo uh, said, uh, my name is uh, Sean Bedorn, and I've been at Georgian College for the last uh, 20 years. And uh, I've had a faculty role for most of that time. I did a little bit of administration as well. And so it's nice to kind of see the other side of things too. And, uh, you know, sort of deciding not only uh, is this a good resource for teaching that I would look at from a faculty point of view, but is this a good investment of our resources uh, to create a good experience for students that's going to move them forward in terms of their own learning. Uh, my personal background is uh, in physiology and pharmacology. And uh, the picture that was on the, uh, the, uh, the, the flyer that Theo sent out is a picture I absolutely hated myself. I think I, I look like a bit of a goof, but um, I feel a little bit more comfortable with this picture anyway. But my background is physiology and pharmacology, and uh, I've been teaching it for a number of years. And I find as much as I can try and make classes interesting um, and provide interesting stories and, and try and help students to make connections with things, it's difficult to create um, experiences that are uh, memorable and different from what might be available in other places. And VR is really sort of an opportunity to do this. And so, uh, you know, Rob and I have been colleagues for a long time, and uh, he introduced me to VR. I think he probably had a plan in place of where he wanted to go with it, but um, he got me interested in VR in about 2020 and set me up with a headset and a program called uh, Nano. And uh, Nanome is a program where you can essentially be at the size of a molecule and you can uh, pick up a molecule, you can rotate it, make it bigger, smaller, you can substitute different pieces into it. And um, you can access a whole uh, a database of proteins and, you know, whatever molecule you want to find, you can probably get it through databases and access it through Nanome and get a really different view of what this molecule looks like and how it can be manipulated and how it might connect with other molecules. And it's a program that's used for drug discovery now, which is quite amazing. And, you know, following that, I think, as I say, Rob's, uh, you know, agenda was maybe getting uh, Georgian into looking anatomy through, uh, through a virtual reality uh, platform. And he introduced me to 3D Organon. And, um, and I absolutely loved it the first time I had exposure to it. And, uh, you know, having looked at 3D Organon and looked at Nanome, uh, I used a little bit of funding in our program, our biotechnology health program, to buy some headsets for our faculty so that we could begin to experiment with what we might be able to do in our program in terms of VR. And so we've been exploring and, and kind of thinking about things, but VR with uh, 3D Organon is really what I tried first. And so what I did is I uh, uh, worked with Rob and, and Rob managed to purchase a whole series of Oculus 2 headsets that were uh, you know, populated with uh, 3D Organon, and I shared them with a number of my students in biotech. And we met informally uh, probably six or seven times over the duration of the semester. And we did little uh, meetings and I had the students experiment with 3D Organon. And what this has led to ultimately is a whole series of collaborations and a whole series, of, now series of studies to sort of assess the efficacy of this VR platform uh, for teaching anatomy to students. So for me, um, you know, this led to collaborations with um, a faculty member at uh, St. Cloud State in Minnesota, 
uh, David Anderson, and uh, we've been working with another couple of faculty members from Georgian on uh, developing uh, uh, immersive experiences in physiology. So anatomy is one part of anatomy and physiology where you're looking at structure, but it's always got to be connected to the function of how a system works, and that's where the physiology comes in. And so creating uh, you know, interactive uh, experiences, contextualized experiences, as Rob states, um, provides some real value to students, and they can experience, uh, you know, experimenting in physiology and determining how different um, variables in a system might affect an outcome of what a system does in a safe and, uh, you know, repeatable and, uh, you know, limitless uh, sort of experiential learning opportunity. So with this group, then we've been, um, you know, looking at how we can develop these VR experiences in physiology, and that's led to developing a grant application for um, uh, developing animations and developing uh, image assets for open educational resources. Um, open educational resources are fantastic, but a lot of these supportive images and sort of a companion um, resources are really not very good. And so being able to develop something that's more realistic that students can interact with, we think will be really valuable. And if we can layer on then immersive experiences too, uh, we think we've got something that would be valuable, really, really valuable for students, whether they're you know, on campus doing a lab uh, with the classmates or with a faculty member in a classroom in VR, or whether they're doing it remotely. Um, as I was preparing for this, it struck me, and I had no idea about this, but it struck me that the, um, the logo for St. Cloud State is a ripoff a bit of the Montreal Canadiens logo. Um, as a Canadian and as a hockey fan, I found this a little bit kind of striking, kind of funny. Anyway, um, VR in anatomy in particular, and for physiology, I hope in the future, really addresses uh, Jeremy Balanson's work and his idea of, of the dice problem uh, in that um, VR is wonderful when it's dangerous to do something or it's impossible to do something or counterproductive or, or just really expensive uh, to do something. And I think what's really great about the 3D Organon product and about VR in general is the idea that you can do what's impossible sometimes. You can, um, and expensive sometimes I guess too, is that you can be in a lab space and you can interact with something in three dimensions and you can grab it and hold it and move it and look at it from different perspectives and really learn something about the, the anatomy of the structure. And, you know, when I think about the resources that we have at Georgian, we have wonderful resources at Georgian. Um, we only have so many bones and we only have so many muscles and we only have so many brains. And it's hard for students to all get their own unique individualized experience. And that's where, you know, 3D Organon and this VR type of a study really comes into place. So for me, when I think about this, um, I think, well, what, what would be an ideal way to teach this? And so what I did with my students, at least initially, uh, when I was just experimenting with 3D Organon and VR, was to, uh, as I say, set up meetings with students and provide them with a populated headset with 3D Organon on it, so that all students really had to do was put the headset on, turn it on, and uh, begin working with it. And so as a faculty, I had to be considerate of the idea that for most students, this is their first experience in VR. So how is that going to make them feel? You know, for me, I've, I've been playing with it for a little while now, and I've got a fairly strong stomach, but I tried a program called Mission International Space Station, and I spent about five minutes on it, thought I was going to vomit, because of the way that you move it. Uh, the movement feels really unnatural because it is very different from how you move here on Earth. So being conscious of how students might uh, be affected by a VR experience is important. And uh, being conscious that for most students, especially first year students, this is their first real opportunity to engage with anatomy. And so being considerate of what some knowledge gaps there might be, uh, what sort of expectations they might have um, is important as well. And we also have to be able to orient the students to the platform, uh, the VR platform itself, as well as to the programming application in terms of what feature it has and uh, what sort of uh, things you can actually do with it. And so I initially met with students through WebEx, and this was the best way to, uh, you know, at this time with, uh, with 3D Organons Networking, uh, it was the best way to meet with students to uh, be able to talk to them and uh, show them things and, um, and have sort of a voice and a face that they could look at uh, as they were experimenting with this program. And so then what I would do is, or what I did is I, uh, you know, set up an orientation to the hand controller. So what do they actually do? 
uh, in terms of making structures bigger or smaller or um, raising them up in your field of view or bringing them down in your field of view. And then I also looked at the other controllers that would allow you to rotate um, an object um, either um, you know, sort of towards you or away from you or rotate either to the left or to the right. And this would allow students to get a different perspective of what structures look like uh, and what a particular uh, model might look like. And then I provided them with some orientation to the main menu so that they'd really be equipped to ultimately explore this on their own. And so I, I could show them the different regional uh, systems that are available, um, microscopic views of say like a nephron or um, a, a neuron, a nerve, whatever it happens to be. And uh, also show them the animations that are available and, um, and just really give them a perspective of what's available up there. And for me, if I'm going to provide them with an activity to do, I then, they then have a frame of reference and if I provide them with a set of directions, they can find the regional menu and they can find the structure that they want or the model that they want and begin exploring with them. And then I also provided, with, provided them with some orientation to the menu. Oops. Uh, this is located on the side of a model. So whenever you touch a structure in 3D Organon, a menu pops up on the right that provides you the information about that particular bone or blood vessel or neuron or whatever it happens to be. And uh, it, it provides another resource of information for students. So not only can they look at these structures and grab these structures, but they can also read about them and they can get a sense of where you know, objects appear. For instance, if we're looking at the sphenoid bone here, uh, we can sort of hide the rest of the skull and you can actually see in three dimensions its positioning, its shape, what it looks like, uh, which bones it abuts against, uh, sort of form sutures with and uh, move around. And you can also use a landmarking function where you can actually zoom in on the bone itself, which I've shown here on the left. And uh, you can get a better sense of, you know, say where the pituitary gland uh, sits in the cell of the, of the of the sphenoid bone. So within the context of 3D organ, there's a lot of material that students can access. And so when I think about this as, a, as an opportunity to interact with students, um, I think about this as being uh, a tool for exploration you know, for students. So, once I've oriented students to the, uh, you know, to the controllers and to the, the, the features of the program, uh, what I did is I set, up, I, set a, I set up a network meeting with students. And in the network uh, room of 3D Organon, you can do demonstrations for students where they can uh, see from your perspective everything that you're doing. So if I wanted to you know, lean forward with the, uh, with the headset into a heart, I could actually see inside the heart. And I could get a sense of the valves and how they connect to the chordae tendini and the papillary muscles and how that fits into the uh, trabeculite carnae that line the inside of the ventricles and, um, and be able to show them the connection with blood vessels and being able to layer on different structures. So this has, you know, this is a, a model from the respiratory system and shows the trachea and uh, the thyroid cartilage and so on. So you know, being able to have all of these structures together and being able to demonstrate to students how they work, how they fit together, um, ends up being really valuable for allowing students, uh, you know, preparing students uh, to ultimately become an explorer. And that to me, at least at this stage of development, is the real value of 3D Organon, whether it's a VR version or whether, like an immersive version or whether it's a desktop version. So in terms of a lesson, what I would do is I'd say we meet with students one night and I provide them with uh, a demonstration and some orientation. I give them an activity to do and I meet up with them the next week and we sort of debrief on it and talk a little bit about what they've done, what they've discovered, what they enjoyed about their experience, what they found frustrating. Um, and again, this is sort of an informal way of, of determining is this a good tool for us to use uh, in terms of studying anatomy. And, you know, what's nice about this immersive VR uh, in a platform in 3D Organon is you know, if I think about a muscle uh, that I could get that students could pick up with their hands and they could peel off a quadricep and they could maybe see a blood vessel and maybe see a nerve. With 3D Organon, you can see the bones, the muscles, the nerves, the blood vessels, and you can take them away and you can add them in and you can spin them around and you can see everything in three dimensions and feel like you're actually working with and looking at a structure uh, that you might actually see in an anatomy lab. It's not exactly a cadaver, but you have access to pictures of those too. But it does provide you with a realistic, um, scaled uh, version of what the body looks like. And so for me, this is tremendously valuable. It was tremendously valuable for our students. 
you know, when I think about what the last two years have been like with uh, COVID, um, you know, had I, had I been able to get students into an anatomy lab where I could have given them bones and given them muscles and, and we could have done a lesson where they could look for different landmarks, what I was able to do instead is provide these students with an experience that was way beyond that. And uh, so what I did is I provided students to, uh, headsets to about 15 students, met with them regularly. And the two things, you know, the two comments that I love the most, particularly the second one, was I really enjoyed using it. I found 3D Organon easy to use and very helpful in visualizing that. And that's something that's difficult for students to do. Um, as an experienced uh, scientist and physiologist, um, I don't have difficulty thinking about what structures look like and how they tie in together. But for a novice learner in anatomy, that's a really difficult skill uh, to, uh, to develop. And so being able to have that experience in three dimensions and be able to walk around and manipulate is really valuable. And this particular student ended up sharing it with her kids and they loved it and shared it with her husband and he loved it. And they ended up getting up their own headsets and now they're experimenting in, uh, in virtual reality as well. But the one that was most powerful for me was a student that said, and a student that really wanted the full hands-on experience of of our program said it felt like a real hands-on lab. So, you know, being in a program where, you know, we feature a lot of lab activities and being limited in what you can do uh, because of something well beyond your control and then having a resource you can access that provides you with a hands-on experience is fantastic. And so with the study, we didn't do a lot of, you know, sort of formal evaluation. I, I kept it deliberately informal. And it didn't assess whether or not it improved their knowledge of anatomy. And there are a number of reasons I didn't do this. But what I really wanted to know about was their engagement and their motivation. And that was through the roof. Um, they all loved it. They all thought it was very positive. And they all took advantage of the experience, not only to explore 3D Organon, but to explore VR in general. And there's value in that too. And so for me, exploration is, is everything with this kind of a program. And so, you know, having experience now with both the desktop version and the VR version, you know, the models, if you played with them, are the same in both um, in, in, in both uh, platforms. So, you know, is it valuable to use one over the other? And, and they're both fantastic. They're both really valuable and, and um, uh, provide a lot of great information. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to establish, well, uh, what would be ideal? What would be the best way to sort of uh, teach our students? And so, you know, the experimental work I did uh, led to some discussion about um, how we could take advantage of 3D Organon and compare uh, sort of three different ways of teaching. So the traditional sort of classroom version that's shown here uh, in an image I've always loved from uh, uh, Dehumani Corpus Fabrica, a book written by and, and drawn by uh, Andreas Vesalius in the 1500s, uh, showing, you know, the professor uh, teaching anatomy by showing the body but there's limitations to that. So we looked at how a traditional classroom approach compared to um, a desktop version approach of 3D Organon versus a more immersive, um, you know, virtual reality Oculus Quest platform uh, for teaching anatomy. And so there's evidence to support that, um, that virtual reality, and whether you look upon this as a desktop non-immersive version or a VR headset immersive version, um, increases uh, the interest in studying something. The enjoyment of students and the motivation of students. And there's also evidence to support that um, having an immersive experience or non-immersive VR experience improves the retention of material, as Rob suggested in uh, the surgical study that he, uh, that he showed and in a number of other studies as well. And this is in comparison to more traditional uh, approaches to teaching. So you're in a classroom, you're uh, using a PowerPoint to show images of a structure, perhaps you have models. Um, and then there's evidence to support, and this is what excites me about 3D Organon and VR in general, is there's evidence to support improved understanding of spatial relationships within complex uh, objects. So when you look at a picture of a heart in a textbook, it's flat. When you look at it on a, um, on a PowerPoint, it's flat. When you look at it on the desktop version, you can rotate around it and you can see there's three dimensions to it, but you can interact with it quite the same way that you can with a, with a VR. Uh, immersive headset type of experience where uh, you're in the lab with, with the structure. There's certainly value to all three, but what we wanted to try and assess is, is there more value to one versus the other? And so what we hypothesized was that students using VR, whether that was desktop or uh, headset based, uh, would, you know, students would show a high level of motivation and enjoyment uh, compared to traditional approaches. 
And then we also wanted to look at uh, the immersive version versus the non-immersive version. So we hypothesized that students would uh, be more engaged and be more voted, motivated and would enjoy it more if they were in a VR headset compared to using a desktop version. And then we also uh, looked uh, to some extent on how students would score on a pre-test, post-test type of a model in terms of their actual knowledge of anatomy and being able to identify structures. Now, I should note that we make sure that all students have access to uh, the 2D version. So we, we've acquired um, uh, 500 communal licenses that can be used by anybody uh, with uh, a username and a password and uh, can be used anytime as long as we don't exceed 500 users at a given time. So we took advantage of this in our study and we recruited students from the biotech program, uh, my program, a paramedic program, and a Bachelor of Science of Nursing program at Georgian College, and provided all students with access to uh, this desktop version of 3D Organon. And for selected units of studies, what we did is we uh, asked students uh, that volunteered to take part in the study to either use exclusively a VR approach uh, using the headset or exclusively use the desktop version um, and then we sort of coupled that with traditional teaching processes, um, particularly in a road environment where we met with students uh, through you know, WebEx or Zoom meetings and, and delivered content to them. And um, for this particular unit of study, uh, we've done the nervous system and, and the cardiovascular system. Uh, we asked that the students only use the resource uh, for which they were randomly assigned to, which is what we did. And um, um, yeah, and, and so really what we wanted to do then is assess through using a couple of different uh, inventories about motivation and about um, enjoyment with, uh, with VR to sort of assess how students were doing. And, um, and what we found uh, really was very similar to what I found informally, but we're gonna have uh, quantified and qualitative data to better support this, is that students really enjoyed using both desktop and immersive versions and they felt engaged in the content and more motivated to explore anatomy. And you know, that in itself to me is really exciting. This is, this is a way of saying uh, to me that this is an environment we wanna play in a little bit more. And we'd like to, we, you know, we'd, we'd be very interested if we could learn anatomy and probably other things as well. You know, as a coordinator for a biotech program, I think about the opportunity to interact with uh, molecules or to practice um, you know, doing electrophoresis and isolating DNA and doing all these other, you know, really fun things, but doing an environment that feels contextualized. And as Rob suggests as well, has a great deal of agency too. And, um, you know, the challenge for us with this particular study is getting a meaningful sample size. And although we've had lots of students volunteer, it's difficult for them uh, because they're participating in the study on top of all the rather regular workload. And so we'd like to do moving forward and we're, we're sort of adapting our, um, our, our research application is to make this part of the curriculum uh, for students in terms of how they study anatomy as part of nursing programs, biotech programs, and now, you know, SAGE, OTA, PTA programs, uh, and so on. And so I think that's really exciting as well. And that will help us, I think, to get to where we want to go in terms of our, in terms of our study. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Theo and Tatiana and 3D Organon for inviting me to be a part of this. I'd like to thank Rob for connecting me with VR in general and, um, I, I sometimes am a little bit shy and, and Rob kind of gets me out of my shell to sort of experiment and, and really to take part in this. And I'd like to thank Isabel Deschamps, Dr. Isabel Deschamps, who's the primary investigator on this research study for sharing uh, what she could about this. Um, I'm a co-investigator, but I have to be blind to what my students are doing. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that this, the funding of this project uh, came through a grant, a uh, Future Skills Center grant, uh, Shockproofing the Future of Work, um, uh, that was awarded to Georgian College to support this particular project with 3D Organon and also two other research projects at Georgian. And uh, just you know, some information about the study of the, the, the work itself. And that's sort of it, that's all I've kind of got to say. Um, again, thank you so much for, uh, for attending and uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, share with you. So I'll turn it back over to Theo and uh, that's it. I have to stop sharing. There we go. Absolutely wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank both Rob and Sean for their very informative and equally comprehensive um, presentations. Without a doubt, um, you the listen the listener 
um, you have fueled, you do fuel the listeners' um, interest in excitement and stimulate their interest in exploring um, immersive learning and, te and teaching um, te XR technologies and how they can actually implement them in, into their educational programs. So thank you very much. It's very exciting. Um, I think we can actually uh, proceed to the um, next and final part of today's webinar, our Q uh, questions and answers. Um, fire away. I, I, I kindly request the participants to um, actually um, ask Rob and Sean, Sean and Rob, um, any questions they feel that they like to make. It looks like there's a couple of questions in the Q and A um, uh, a feed. Um, so uh, Jose Marie Carpena asks, says, "I'm currently using VR for education, and he's in the Philippines. And a common question is how to make it accessible, especially to students that are not well off. Uh, besides VR by proxy, um, how do you suggest to get around this problem?" Um, I, I can answer this a little bit, but I think I'll leave it more to Rob. Uh, with this project we're working on in, with this group in Minnesota at St. Cloud State uh, University, what we really envisioned is being able to uh, send a, a headset uh, to a user wherever they are uh, that's fully loaded with uh, programming, teaching, uh, and learning resources. And the student would make use of the VR headset over the duration of the semester, and the VR headset would then record um, you know, uh, quiz scores, test scores, um, interactions, you know, whatever was involved with the coursework. And then at the end of the, um, at the end of the semester, then the student would send the headset back in and then they would be evaluated in terms of what it is they've, they've accomplished sort of very remotely in terms of, 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 of using VR. Um, but Rob, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, there, um, there are uh, so many opportunities, but uh, on the other side of the coin, there are some barriers to, to uh, mm -hmm. virtual reality adoption. One is the cost of the hardware, the other is the cost of the software, and um, and the other is uh, accessibility in terms of you know, Wi-Fi and so on. There, just on the Wi-Fi uh, question, there are uh, programs, companies that will provide fully loaded headsets where no Wi-Fi is required, where the connection is there. Um, and how, you know, cost often depends on what you're uh, planning to use virtual reality for. And for me, for example, one of the important questions in terms of return on investment is how many learning objectives does a virtual reality experience address? And so, you know, language, language in VR and anatomy in VR is a bit of a no brainer because it addresses um, a large number of learning objectives uh, within a course. Um, but um, in terms of funding, uh, you know, some schools uh, use grant funding. That's one, one option. I think now is a really good time to apply for grant money because governments around the globe are looking at new and innovative ways of uh, helping students learn. Uh, so I would say, uh, you know, look at what is it you hope your students are going to learn in virtual reality and does virtual reality provide something that's unique um, you know, either the spatial experience, the contextual experience, you know, as, as Dr. Medoran was describing earlier, the concept of infinite scalability, where you can take a coronavirus and make it the size of a basketball or a molecule and manipulate it, and um, manipulation of it has consequences. Um, so, you know, you sort of have to look at all of those different angles as, as metrics uh, for uh, selecting hardware and software and, and uh, looking at the accessibility issues. I don't know if that was helpful, but. Well, the second uh, comment from Jill is, I attended a mini conference on VR this week, virtual reality and learning, uh, leading the way. And the opening session presenter talked about us being in the same stage with VR as we were with preschool learning with Sesame Street 50 years ago, would you agree? Hmm. I'm gonna leave that to Rob as well, I think. Yeah, I'm not seeing that question. That must be in the Q and, oh, okay, it's in the Q and A. Yeah, um, yeah uh, so um, 
I'm a, an educational technology enthusiast and I'm an early adopter, but I'm also a skeptic. And I think it's really important to be skeptical about um, the, the power of any learning medium to transform uh, the way students learn. But, but, um, but I think virtual reality definitely has a great deal of potential in that, that it provides experiential learning that students can actually do things. And uh, I just, you know, I, I, I hope there comes a time where instead of students sitting in rows in a classroom that uh, we'll have students learning from a distance, maybe in virtual reality, meeting the teacher in, in, uh, a, con in a, a contextual environment uh, where they have agency, they're able to do things with their hands. It makes, you know, it makes no sense, for example, to um, talk about Greek history with a PowerPoint presentation when you could be sitting with your students on the steps of the Parthenon in virtual reality. Um, and so I think, you know, with respect to the comparison to Sesame Street, <laughs> Sesame Street was a pretty gold standard. And, and Sesame Street, what I love about Sesame Street is it ad addressed not just basic uh, learning, um, but also you know, perceptions and values and, you know, uh, perspective taking and uh, virtual reality has the power to, to, to do that as well, uh, to do perspective taking. But um, in terms of the technology, the headsets are going to get lighter, they're going to get smaller, the, the um, uh, fidelity is going to get higher and uh, the, the software is going to get less and less expensive. And uh, I think we're going to see more and more uh, really valuable hands-on learning experiences in virtual reality. And I, I would just add that it's so important for us as educators to get uh, involved in exploring this medium now and to communicate with companies to tell them, you know, what our, our, the pedagogical needs are for our students. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, I talked with a company who, who used patient simulation and it was full of drop-down lists. And I, I just said, you know, uh, we, you know, in the real world, uh, we don't deal with drop down lists. In the real world, we talk to patients and clients and we, <laughs> we interact with them with their hands and, uh, and through conversation. And that's what we need to do in virtual reality uh, to give that spatial experience, to give context, to have agency. Those are really critical. So I think uh, VR has just untapped potential going forward, especially as, you know, it gets cheaper, lighter, better. Um, and uh, teachers help drive the pedagogy behind the design. I'd like to add there, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, not only drive the, the, the pedagogy behind that, uh, the, the teachers drive the pedagogy behind what you did, the last statement, I particularly like that statement, but also in the new global teaching and learning environment, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, we do want students to actually take more control of their self of their learning, self-directed learning, always with the teacher's environment, but get them more involved, get them to have more responsibility and more control of it. Yeah, that's a much broader, uh, uh, much broader question. <laughs> yeah, sure. But uh, I, yeah, I don't disagree. And, and I think, you know, now with uh, the advent of the internet, um, students, especially in higher education, I, I don't work in K-12, to so it's difficult for me to speak to that level, but in higher education, students are getting differentiated, differentiated, differentiated learning on their own, right, which is so important. So they're learning about something from me, but then they're learning it from someone else uh, who has a bit of a different perspective or presents it in a slightly different way, and that's very powerful. And virtual reality, augmented reality is just one more medium to be able to learn something from a different perspective, which is, I think, incredibly powerful. And I think as a faculty member, it helps uh, for us as also, you know, with this differentiated learning that students do, it helps for us to provide perspective and to um, help to sort of guide what it is they do a little bit anyway, um, so that uh, we make sure that students continue to find good information. And, you know, as you said, on Sesame Street, that they uh, learn not just values and ethics and, and morals, but that they also learn um, about how to connect with people and about how to interact with people and it's not just an academic exercise of, of looking at different resources but providing a human touch and a context to it as well that's one of the other values of virtual reality is the sense of presence the, the feeling mm -hmm. like you're with people and and recognizing that avatars are real people and it's also a concern as well because there's um, you know tends to be more 
on uh, incidents of harassment and bullying in virtual reality than there are on other platforms. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that, uh, all forms of social media. So, you know, this is something that all of us as educators and parents have to have to address is, um, uh, you know, that interacting with people online, whether it's social media or whether it's virtual reality, is the same as interacting with people face to face. You know, we have to be respectful and um, be it aware has to be of, an our... element of We have to be able to create an element of safety for students and uh, yeah. uh, have ground rules for what's appropriate and what's not appropriate in the environment and create an etiquette and uh, and so sort of set of common guidelines to, um, you know, to use as, as students explore in VR. And then there's what to expect from VR technology within the next year is what would you like to see in the healthcare education VR platform? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see uh, hardware companies be, become more education friendly. This is currently an issue right now, not just pricing, but, um, you know, in terms of being able to use uh, multiple headsets on single accounts and things of that nature. And some hardware uh, has extensive access to virtual reality applications, whereas other pieces of hardware have limited access. And so it's all an ongoing thing. And privacy is huge. Yes, thanks, Jill, uh, is huge, right? And uh, privacy, ethics, um, all of those things are uh, really important, especially when we get into more advanced virtual reality headsets with biometrics that, that track uh, gaze and pupillometry and, um, you know, have galvanic skin sensors and, uh, and measure pulses um, and can, uh, you know, so gauge whether someone's excited about an advertisement or not. And we need to be able to, you know, by default, have that shut off. Uh, in my personal view, and I think governments are really slow to react to develop policies um, to to ensure privacy is protected in in uh, virtual environments and using this technology. I think it's just so new for governments. This may be a little simplistic to say, but um, you know, data analytics uh, plays a huge role in decision making and uh, how companies choose to use it uh, can certainly influence what people choose to do. Uh, so there needs to be, an of, and again, an element of responsibility and, and uh, safety for users um, so that they can get a, a safe experience. Yeah, and I would just add on the flip side of biometrics um, and the privacy issue on the flip side, um, the, the potential for using biometrics in healthcare in particular um, is really exciting to be able to actually gauge, um, measure cognitive load or measure stress levels and be able to scaffold the student's learning in such a way that it builds in stress resilience um, is, is something that was, has been you know, really impossible until now. And, and now it's truly possible. So um, you know, we, uh, I've been teaching paramedics for 20 years. And the lab uh, just can't possibly prepare them for what they're gonna see in the hospital. And the hospital doesn't always prepare them for what they're gonna see in the field. And so we can begin to do that in virtual reality in a quantitative way or, or be able to quantify um, the reaction to those experiences and scaffold them in such a way, as I, as I said, to uh, build in stress resilience. That's, that's very exciting. Fantastic. Any other questions from, from our participants? No? Yeah, COVID. So um, I talk with uh, schools all over the world uh, and companies as well from around the globe. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, it's, it's my uh, perception that uh, most virtual reality labs at universities and colleges shut down during the pandemic and are just now starting to, to open up. Um, we, we were quite fortunate in that um, at Georgian College in that we were able to launch virtual reality for distance learning uh, just before the pandemic and continued through the pandemic and that worked quite well. Uh, but we did close our, our labs and uh, we're just starting to reopen our labs now. And uh, 
Um, I was going to say, if, if anyone wants to reach out to me and um, chat about um, sort of how you might integrate virtual reality into learning and uh, about, you know, when is it appropriate to build a virtual reality lab, when is it appropriate to use VR for distance learning, uh, I'd be happy to connect with people. Uh, they can find me on um, uh, LinkedIn. I'll just share a link to my slides. That's a, nope, nope, sorry. That's the wrong uh link here um i'll share a link to my slides um and uh people want to reach out to me on linkedin happy to connect with people there you go um just on that note i think it's really important you know most most teachers have some sort of peer learning network either through um, you know, their work or through uh, their school board or their college system or through their social media system. And I think it's important for us as educators to connect with each other and learn from each other um, and, um, and be able to share sort of our successes and failures and challenges and, and um, uh, work through some opportunities. Um, we, you know, Sean and I have sort of stumbled on some uh, collaboration opportunities that uh, you know sometimes just came out of the blue. In fact, the collaboration with St. Cloud State University came about because I was at a virtual reality event and I happened to run into uh, a teacher from St. Cloud State and we had a conversation and that led to uh, a collaboration. So, you know, um, a community college in Ontario and a university in Minnesota are a bit of an odd mix, but uh, it's <laughs> worked out really well. It's just been an excellent partnership and I'm really excited about what I think we're gonna be able to do together. Uh, Rob is, is uh, please feel free to reach out to Rob. Uh, Rob is wonderful at uh, connecting people and, uh, and uh, clearly loves uh, VR and uh, educational technology. And, and in my experience is always happy to chat about it and provide some uh, guidance in terms of where you can look for information, who you can contact about particular interests and uh, just a really nice guy to talk to as well. And uh, uh, I guess I should have stated up front in terms of conflict of interest, neither Sean nor I um, make any money from 3D organons. So uh, there's <laughs> no conflict there. Actually, well said, I'm glad you, you, you <laughs> stipulated that. Yes, I, actually, great, fantastic. Um, I think we can safely say we can wrap it up. Um, I would like to thank you from the bottom of our hearts both um, Rob Thoreau and, and Dr. Sean Madoran um, for the valuable contribution for sharing their insight and their, their experiences and their um, information. Um, I also know it's first thing in the morning um, <laughs> in Canada, so an extra thank you for that too. Um, it's an awkward hour, so thank you. Sincerely, thank you to our participants. Um, I would like to share just very quickly um, two quotes that um, I have sort of impressed upon me that my, and I consider my favorite quotes in my readings on VR. Um, the future of education in which VR plays an important role is technologically advanced, efficient and exciting. I think in a few words, it sums up the whole meaning of VR and virtual reality is the natural next step for the evolution of medical education. So these are two of my favorite quotes that I've actually happened to stumble on and I use them quite often. So I think on that note, um, we can close today's webinar. Again, a, a special thank you to both um, Rob and Sean and to our participants. Um, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you, stay safe and well. <laughs>